Our scripture readings, there are two of them this morning. The first of them is from the prophets, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. And this is from the Passion Translation, which I found interesting. Oh God, if only you would tear open the heavenly realm and come down to us. How the mountains would tremble in your awesome presence. In the same way that fire sets kindling to blaze and causes water to boil, let the fire of your presence come down. Reveal to your enemies your mighty name and cause the nations to tremble before you. When you did amazing wonders we did not expect, you came down and the mountains shuddered in your presence. These amazing things had never been heard of before. You did things never dreamed of. No one perceived your greatness. No eye has ever seen a God like you who intervenes for those who wait and long for you. Those who delight in doing what is right, you go out to meet them with kindness. They remember you and cherish your ways. You showed your anger when we sinned again and again, yet we can be saved. We have all become contaminated with sin and you see our self-righteousness as nothing better than an unclean rag. We are all like fallen leaves and our sins sweep us away like the wind. No one calls on your name or presses in to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. You have let us be ruined by our own sins. Yet still, Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. Each one of us is the creative artistic work of your hands. Yahweh, please do not be angry with us. Don't remember our sins forever. Please look at us. We are your people. And from the gospels, the book of Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 31. This is from the New International Reader's Version. So in those days, there will be terrible suffering. After that, scripture says, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not shine, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the son of man coming in clouds. He will come with great power and glory. He will send his angels. He will gather his chosen people from all four directions. He will bring them from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches become tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that the end is near. It is right at the door. What I'm about to tell you is true. The people living now will certainly not pass away until all those things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will endure forever. Let our hearts be open to listen and continue to learn. Would you pray with me, please? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your presence. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but to me, the beginning of our reading from Mark's gospel sounds about right for the start of Advent in the year of our Lord 2020. In those days, there will be terrible suffering. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. I know that feeling more than ever this year, don't you? The feeling of uncertainty. 
where everything is so disrupted that it seems like even the most reliable of things, the sun and the moon and the stars and the sky might stumble and fall. The feeling of dimness where everything seems foggy and it's hard to tell which way is up or which way we're going, or it feels like we might actually just be lost and walking in pointless, endless circles. The feeling of suffering so overwhelming that it sits like a weight on your chest, suffering so widespread that it feels like there is no refuge to which to turn. Suffering so inexorable that it feels like there is nothing you or any of us can do to make it any better. I know that feeling more than ever this year, and it's not a very hopeful feeling. It's not a very cheery text, this reading for the first Sunday of Advent. It doesn't exactly put you in the Christmas spirit, make you want to sing joy to the world. But in the church year, it's not yet time for Christmas. It's time for Advent, which is the season of watching and waiting, hoping, dreaming, yearning and longing for a future brighter than the past or the present. And given the year we've all had, I think yearning and longing for a better future feels about right. In this reading, in Mark's account of Jesus' words, the kind of year we've all had, the uncertainty and dimness and suffering and anxiety and yearning and longing, that is exactly the moment, Jesus says, where God will enter in. Mark says that Jesus says that it is then. Now, right in the midst of those times of struggle and suffering and uncertainty, right there and then, that God's power and glory show up most palpably. When healing feels far, far out of reach, Jesus says it is then that God's tender mercies break forth. When reconciliation and justice seem impossibly distant, Jesus says it is then that God's peace breaks in. When the powers of the heavens are shaken, Jesus says it is then that God's redemption draws nigh. Come what may, here on earth, Jesus says God's promises will never fade, but will remain trustworthy and true until they come to their final fruition. At just exactly the moment when it feels like hope is evaporating forever, at just exactly the moment where it feels like the old world is dying, that the new world might be born. It's reminiscent of the words we heard from the prophet Isaiah, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Come on, God, you have promised to show up where your people are suffering. Come on through here. Now would be nice. Although the images Isaiah uses may feel even a bit disturbing, God coming as a fire that kindles brushwood, causes water to boil, makes mountains quake. Although those images may not feel particularly comforting in a year that held devastating wildfires and hurricanes on top of everything else, I can appreciate the sentiment, the full-throated cry for God to show the heck up and make things right. Isaiah's words, of course, were not the first time, nor would that time be the last time that faithful people confronting an untenable situation cried out to God for help. That was not the first time, nor would it be the last, that faithful people feeling desperate called for a divine warrior, an all-powerful deity to intervene in an overwhelming, dramatic way. That was not the first time nor would it be the last that faithful people who were suffering prayed for God to overturn it all. But hearing this reading as Advent begins, when we know where this season leads, hearing this reading as Advent begins with preparations underway for an altogether beautiful, if altogether different, remote Christmas Eve service, Hearing this reading as Advent begins with the Christ candle, though yet unlit, beckoning us through these four weeks toward tidings of comfort and joy. Hearing this reading as Advent begins, I am mindful that when we cry out to God for help, when we call for a divine warrior and all-powerful deity, when, when we pray 
for God to tear open the heavens and come down. What we think we want is not always what we get. Hearing this reading as Advent begins, I am mindful that when we ask for wildfire, we get candlelight. When we ask for earthquake, we get embrace. When we ask for the omnipotent divine warrior to tear open the heavens and come down, we get a newborn baby. Wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, we get Jesus. Now, if we're honest, and if we're willing to risk sounding maybe a little bit heretical, sometimes this can feel like a disappointment. There are things in this world that need to be dramatically overturned. There are circumstances in this world that are absolutely untenable. There are situations in this world, personal and communal and global, that require complete and utter transformation. If any of us did not know this before this year, we know it now. I don't know about you, but as I look around for hope, this year especially, I sometimes feel like Isaiah and the long ago Israelites to whom he spoke. I want to see hope tearing open the heavens, coming down, setting things ablaze and making mountains quake. I want to see illness cured instantaneously. I want to see suffering alleviated as with a magic wand. I want to be together with the people I love now without fear of deadly pestilence. I want to see families healed children nurtured and cherished, refugees welcomed, our ravaged earth restored, oppressive systems destroyed, hatred and bigotry wiped away. I want an edict from the highest heavens, a potent word that will not fail to accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. And yet, when I remember who Jesus is and how God chooses to move in the world. I remember that hope comes in small, vulnerable, tender ways, in a gentle word to an estranged lover and a longed for child who finally arrives, in a job offer that follows more applications than you can count, in a week, a month, a year of sobriety one day at a time in family members who put up Christmas decorations for a loved one who's hospitalized, in a new medication that's making life livable again, in a phone call from a friend who reaches out at exactly the moment when you need a little love, in a hot meal served to all comers from the door of a church parish house. It turns out that the God we know in Jesus works most often on a human scale. And hope comes most often that way too, not as fire from the sky, but as this little light of mine, not as booming thunder, but as a still small voice. When I remember who Jesus is and how God chooses to move in the world, I am reminded that the birth of an infant is how God changed the world forever. And so as this Advent season dawns, if for you, as for me, hope may seem small, faint, vulnerable, and tender, maybe that actually means it is about to transform everything. Maybe that actually means that God is present, coming even now to make all things new. May it be so. Amen.